In this, the eleventh study of the Song of Songs, we reach chapter 6, verse 10, and through to chapter 7, verse 13. It's another substantial section. And in the New International Version it reads, Who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession? I went down to the grove of nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley to see if the vines had budded or the pomegranates were in bloom. Before I realised it, my desire set me among the royal chariots of my people. Come back, come back, O Shulamite, come back, come back, that we may gaze on you. Why would you gaze on the Shulamite as on the dance of Machanaim? Why would you gaze on the Shulamite? How beautiful your sandaled feet, O Prince's daughter! Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hand. Your navel is a round goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabbaim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are, and how pleasing, my love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of the palm, and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. May the wine go straight to my beloved, flowing gently over lips and teeth. I belong to my beloved, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside, let us spend the night in the villages, let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom, there I will give you my love. The mandrakes send out their fragrance, and at our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my beloved. The poems included in the Song of Songs often leave the reader puzzled as to their meaning. This is probably supremely true of the first three verses of the section we're studying here. It's not clear who is speaking, how many people are speaking, and what precisely is being said. However, the language of verses 11 and 12 is obviously erotic and refers to an arousal that provoked a sense of royal privilege. Whether it's the wife addressing her husband or vice versa depends upon how one interprets the double meaning in the picture of new growth among the nuts flourishing in the valley, and the reference intended in the meaning of the budding of vines and pomegranates. Perhaps the language is deliberately ambiguous. As elsewhere in the song, the sexual act is sensitively described without resorting to the pornographic or explicit. But whichever is chosen, there is no doubt that we are once again introduced to the young couple, delightedly enjoying passionate encounter. But what about verse 13? Perhaps we are to understand the earlier statement as a suggestion by the bride's friends that she joins them as before for a night out together. The response perhaps by her husband is not a claim to exclusive access to his wife, but reminds them of her change of status. In her culture it was the unmarried women who danced. Things cannot be as they once were, neither did the bride or the groom wish them so as the sequel shows. Chapter 7 is relatively uncomplicated to interpret. In verses 1 to the first part of verse 9, the young man speaks about his wife. In the remainder of the chapter, she speaks. In the previous chapter, the husband spoke of his wife as a person in her own right, a person whom he was coming to increasingly adore the more he got to know her. Here the language is, however, more focused and erotic. It echoes chapter 4, but there is something rather more uninhibited in his works here. There they were the words of a shy young man who is catching sight for the first time of his wife as she takes off her clothes. 
Here, the language reflects an existing and growing intimacy. In verses 1 to 5, he describes his wife from foot to head. We can almost imagine her perhaps tantalisingly slipping out of her shoes, removing a dress, one by one removing her underclothes until she stands before him naked. Naturally, when fully revealed in verses 6 to the beginning of 9a, his eyes are drawn to those parts of her body that now arouse him. So he re refers to her lips, breasts and probably the meeting point of her thighs. Verse 10 indicates that the young woman is well aware of the impact she has had upon her husband. It would of course have been difficult for her to have missed it, especially if he too was naked. And in this context her words, I belong to my beloved, are to be understood as her expression of mutual commitment. She might have said, I belong to him because he belongs to me. It is a reflection of their mutual self-giving. This prompts her to respond with a double invitation. She's happy. She longs for renewed embrace. Indeed, so much is this so that she proposes a weekend break where they can enjoy themselves far away from prying eyes and listening ears. And there, she tantalisingly suggests, she has something new to provide for him. We note incidentally that in this chapter the young woman seeks to take the initiative in seduction, invitation and proposal. This is a far cry from lie back and think about England. So the poem ends, but as with all the songs in the Song of Songs, it is intended to convey a message, to remind us of perspectives that we should seek to adopt in our understanding of human, of human sexuality. Placed after the previous poem in which the young man expressed his increasing devotion to the young woman for who she was, here he expresses his sexual desires more fully than anywhere else in the book. Earlier his longings were, for the, were those of one who, hormones all over the place, desperately needed consummation with his wife on their wedding night. Here the longings remain and are even intensified but that intensification arises from his desires for her as a person. It is as if deeper the, the deeper the love, the more sexually aroused he is. Love then both deepens the experience and stimulates it. So implicitly this poem suggests that sexual arousal and intimacy is enriched within the mutual commitment of one in ever deepening love for the other. Moreover, the way in which both husband and wife are increasingly unembarrassed by one another's nakedness and delight in witnessing their mutual arousal, in the context, in this case, of the wife's seduct seductive behaviour, is a far cry from how the Christian view of human sexuality is so often presented. Indeed, throughout the chapter there are yet again echoes of the Garden of Eden. There, sin prompted the first couple to clothe themselves, to hide their shame from one another, in this chapter there is no shame, only uninhibited delight in one another, precisely because there are no secrets from which either of them wish to hide. Here the couple do not look to dress themselves, but excitedly to strip off their clothes before one another. This young couple are depicted then as experiencing a glimpse of what it means to be made in the image of God and unashamed of their humanity. To experience humanity to the full, this poem implies, is to enjoy unalloyed loving intimacy and a deepening intensity and a consequent delight in the yearning for the ecstatic embrace of another. And this is so precisely because they are created in the image of God, Father, Son and Spirit have yearned after one another in an eternal and ever fresh embrace. In creating humanity in their own image they have extended that embrace to their creation and have implanted within the human person a longing to seek not only after another to complement them, but to find in that other an experience that illustrates and indeed embodies the pathway to a deeper intimacy with and a vision of God.